Arn Anderson, Ole Anderson, Ric Flair, and Tully Blanchard, the four horsemen. We'll find out about them next. All right, man, a lot, a lot, a lot to get into today, but it's so good. If you've been with us over the past few weeks, I'm going to stop you and just say if you have it, man, go watch last week's video first and then come to this week because if you're if you're missing it's going to be it's going to be a little out there revelation chapter six man revelation six um jesus is going to start cracking open he's got the scroll the lamb was worthy to open the scroll and now he's going to start cracking seals and and I just want to stop for just a second because this has been really a, a beautiful thing for me to understand. I had always understood growing up and hearing from pastors that, and, and maybe it was just my misconception, but I'd always understood it that everything in Revelation was kind of future tense and that Jesus was going to you know, break open these seals later on and that once he started breaking them open, it was going to be this like rapid succession of seals being broken. I kind of want to, I, I got to step away from that because as I've read through this, we're going to read through the seals and, and I want you to understand that this has been probably, as I read it, an ongoing long time opening of these seals and, and culmination of this prophetic. So let's look at it. Revelation chapter 6, and I'm in the NASB, different Bible, so if you're following along, not that I don't like the other one, but it's just the one I had. NASB says, Then I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, the first seal, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying as with a voice of thunder, Come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. And so the first seal is broken by Jesus. The, four, the first beast looks and says, Come. He's saying, Come to the rider, not to John. And the horse comes out, and you see this beautiful white horse. You see a rider on it who is carrying this bow and arrow, and he is given the ability to conquer and to go out and conquer the earth. Now, I want to stop right here because how you view this rider is going to have a direct result on how you view everything in Revelation. There are people who will say that this is Jesus Christ. That he is, because he's on a white horse and because he's given the ability to conquer, that this is Jesus. Guys, this is not Christ. Christ does, later on, I think it's Revelation 19, come riding a white horse. But if you notice, Christ is carrying a sword. The sword was always the symbol for victory. So this first rider who is let loose looks like Christ, imitates Christ, but is not Christ, okay? So the first rider, I think, from the first seal being broken is not the Antichrist, not the one that we're going to talk about later, but I'm going to put this in lower A, lower, lower case, smaller Antichrist. I think these are people who come along who are false prophets, who are false teachers, who are simply against Christ, who are simply anti Christ. And I think there have been a long list of those people throughout history. I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to say this, and I'm going to try to prove to you through this next little bit. I think this first seal was broken at the death of Jesus Christ. I think when Jesus died and he ascended to heaven, because there couldn't be an antichrist until there was a Christ, I think when Jesus died and ascends to heaven, the first seal is broken. I know we got to shift time a little bit. Listen, God is without time or space. God does not work how we work in linear. So when he pulls John up, John sees, we, he almost takes John in time backwards to where Christ first comes in. That's why there was nobody found in heaven who could open the seal who could take the scroll because Jesus wasn't in heaven. Jesus was on earth. Then all of a sudden, Jesus, the slain lamb at his death, comes back to heaven to take his seat. He's handed the scroll and he breaks the first seal. And that first seal is these antichrists, these false prophets who are going to come in his name and say, look, it's me. I've returned. This is who I am. 
and they're going to beg for your control and they're going to beg for your love and your adoration and they're going to try to receive the glory that belongs to Christ. Then, secondly, he broke the second seal and I heard the second living creature <clears throat> saying, Come. And another, a red horse, went out and to him who sat on it, he was granted to take peace from the earth that men would slay one another and a great sword was given him. So now this rider on the red horse is given a sword. He's given the actual victory here. So this is what happens. He's given the ability to come out and take peace away from the world. And I think that one was broken shortly after the death of Christ. Because in the Old Testament, you hear of godly war starting because God's name had been desecrated and God's, God's reputation had been, had been drugged through the mud. And to receive glory, God initiated and allowed these wars in the Old Testament to start. We don't go to war anymore for God. God has not spoken to any leader that I know of in a very long while and told them to go to war so that he could be glorified. I really think that after the death of Jesus, you see this second seal busted open and these wars begin to start and we begin to go to war. We, peace begins to draw out of the world. And it, we, we go to war now for, for stupid things, for power, for money, for prestige, for, you know, to keep our reputation. The third seal. Jesus breaks the third seal and I hear the third living creature say, Come, and I looked and behold a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures say, A quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius. And do not damage the oil and the wine. This is going to be a famine, a pestilence across the land. You're going to start seeing crops that are devastated. You're going to start seeing the inflation of things. Guys, we've already seen this. We're seeing this now. And I think it's come in waves and stages. There's been these ebbs and flows as that third one has broken out. That you have the Great Depression. That you have all of these things that, that are happening all over the world where, guys, we don't farm food anymore. We create food. We don't naturally grow hardly anything. It's synthesized processed foods. What do you think happens when we lose the art of growing food for ourselves? Eventually, these things are going to happen. And I, I look at, you know, these third world countries that are going through some of these things. Just because it's good with us right now doesn't mean it's good with everybody. This isn't a prophecy to America. This is a prophecy to the world. And so as this pestilence comes across the land, you see, you hear this saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius. A denarius in John's day was a day's wages. <clears throat> this would have actually been about 12 times, 12 to 13 times the original amount. So this would be some egregious amount. But if you look at what's affected here for wheat and for barley, Right? Short-term grains that are grown quickly and harvested quickly. But do not touch, do not damage the oil and the wine. So there will be this pestilence that is allowed to ravage some crops. But there will be foods, these long-standing, long-term foods. I mean, olive trees take a long time to grow and produce olives and produce oil. Grapes take a long time to, to create wine and then ferment and create... So there is this there's this understanding that while the pestilence comes over the land and it attacks some of these crops there are going to be long standing crops that will be able to endure so uh, a little bit of ease there for this famine that it, that it won't devastate everything and when the lamb broke the fourth seal i heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying come and i looked and behold an ashen horse or a pale horse and he who sat on it had the name Death, and Hades followed with him. And authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword and with famine and with pestilence and by the wild beasts of the earth. Now, by the wild beasts doesn't just mean wild pigs and lions and, and tigers. Wild beasts can be 
it was given the ability for malaria. It was given the ability, you know, through germ, through pandemic, through epidemic, through all of these different instances. Now, the interesting thing here is if we're understanding that Christ dies, goes to heaven, takes the seal directly after that, begins to open these four seals, we see Antichrist, we see false prophets rising, we see the lack of peace and how people are turning on one another even more today than they were then. We see the famine and the desolation caused by overpopulation and by lack of food resources and all of these things. And then we start to see death because of it. And these numbers to devastate the earth are going to total, God tells us, one quarter of the earth. See, I used to think that when these four hit, that it was like, you know, the day of the Lord, these four hit, and then a quarter of the earth was immediately wiped off. As I've studied in on this, I think it's this. I think there is a cumulative total number of people that God will allow to live on this earth, and only He knows that number. So through all of time, and I like to throw the number 700 trillion because it just sounds like a really big number. 700 trillion. When a quarter of those people have been affected by these first four, by the first four riders, then we will go into the next movement. Does that make sense? And I hope that makes sense, but it pairs perfectly as we look at how God is laying out the book of Revelation. The fifth seal. The Lamb breaks the fifth seal, and I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And there was given to each of them a white robe and they were told that they should rest for just a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed, even as they had been, would be completed also. So Christ has opened this fifth seal, and I think that fifth seal has been opened. I think that that's Stephen. I think that it's Peter. I think that it's Paul. I think that those are the martyrs, the people who have lived their lives and given their witness to Jesus Christ and have died, and I think they are now where God is. I think they are seated at, underneath the altar, and they are looking at Jesus, and they are going, how long is it going to take? And I think we are living right here in this fifth seal right now. I don't think we're going to get to, I don't think we're in six yet. I'll, I'll explain that in the next video. We're going to roll through six and seven. It's going to be awesome. But I think we're here because this is the first time in all of heaven that you see that phrase, how long. So this denotes to me, it helps me to understand that there is this long expanse of time. Even though a day in heaven is like a thousand, you know, a thousand years here is like a day in heaven. These souls have been there for some long period and are looking at Jesus and going, how long until you vindicate us? How long until you avenge us? And Jesus looks at them and says, there are still yet some of those on this earth who must suffer how you suffered. These are our Christian brothers and sisters martyrs in the churches in China, in churches in Africa, in churches in the Middle East who are presenting the Word of God and are killed for their faith. They are ushered into this. This is those of us who have given our lives, I think, I don't even think I have to necessarily die as a martyr. I think it's just those of us who die carrying the name of Jesus Christ at our death. I think this is your loved one who have gone on before and you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they loved Jesus and that Jesus loved them. This is them. And they're looking and they're going, God, we're just ready. We're ready for that new heaven and that new earth. God, we're ready for that permanent dwelling place. God, we're ready. We're ready. We're ready. And Jesus looks and goes just a little while longer because there are more to be added, more to be added. And guys, you have to understand that there's only two situations for me as a Christian. Either I'm going to die before Jesus comes back and I'm going to be one of these souls begging him to avenge me or I'm going to be caught up in the rapture which is going to happen right shortly after this and I can show you where that happens. But I think this is where we are. I think we're in this age where the four seals have been opened and, and, and listen, 
I don't think it's seal number one and then when seal two is open that seal one is over. I think they culminate on top of each other. So we are still living in one, two, three, and four. The riders are still riding around the earth, affecting the earth, and that seal five is ongoing right now, that as the earth is being devastated through pestilence, through wars, through lack of peace, through all of these things, through false prophets, I think they are th th right now in heaven that there are these souls who are just begging God, begging God for mercy. And I think when six hits, and we're not going to get into six today because I think six and seven go really well together. When six hits, and I think six is still a future event, I think it is the, it is the beginning of the actual end. I think six is what we are all waiting for. I think, and we'll talk about that again next time, six and seven and how they, how they pair together. I want really quickly, with just a few minutes left, if you have your Bibles open, man, flip over to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24, Jesus is speaking. They ask him, the disciples ask him very plainly. Verse 3, Matthew 24, 3, as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things happen and what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? They just flat out ask him, what are we looking for for you to come back? If you're the Messiah and you're coming back for us, what are we going to see? Look at what Jesus says. Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. Rider number one. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened, for those things must take place. But that is not yet the end. Number two. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. In various places there will be famines and earthquakes, but all of these things are merely the beginning of birth pains. We're into three. These are the contractions we feel. As the Bible says, we groan with expectation. All of creation groans with this expectation of what is to come. We're going through contractions. Then they will deliver you to tribulation, not the great tribulation, small and they will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and mislead many. Because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. There's number four. So we see all of those culminated together, that there will be death, that there will be betrayal, that there will be this misleading by all of these false prophets, that there will be wars, that people's love will grow cold, that, the, that even inside of the church, man, it will just become just stale and depressing. Look at what Jesus says, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. And then, and then the end will come. So what a beautiful thing, guys, for us. It's super scary, man. When you sit and you look at it, you realize that we are already in this movement of revelation. Like I always thought revelation was like something like far off. We're already in the midst of it. We're already in the middle of it. Jesus, 2,000 years ago, called his shot. And look at what's coming out. Look at what's happening. And then John comes back and writes verbatim what Jesus said. And we're seeing it playing out. But listen to the words of Christ. To the one who endures to the end, salvation will come. To the one who not perfectly executes and lives perfectly, but to the one who hangs on to faith, to the one who in the middle of famine says God will provide. To the one who in the middle of war says God is my king. To the one in the middle of politics says Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. To the one who in the middle of false prophets says I will stand even if I stand alone for the word of God, for the correct word of God. To him and to Him alone will salvation come. Guys, if you're here and you're listening, guys, it's only going to get better in 6 and 7. It's going to get super spooky. 
but it's going to get so much better for us who are in Christ. I can promise you that. For those of you that are not in Christ, this should serve as a wake-up call. You're already in the middle of it. You're already seeing everything falling into place. So get your bags packed and get things right. If you haven't given your life to Jesus, do it. It's as simple as saying, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Father, I know that I've messed up. I know I've made mistakes. But Lord, I want to accept you as my Savior so that I don't have to endure this great tribulation that's coming, so that I don't have to deal with all of this desolation that's coming on the earth. Father, I want to live with you, and I want to fall in love with you, and I want to just have more of you. Guys, He's there, and He will answer. The great Lamb, the great Lamb, who is opening seals, but is opening them up slowly for your benefit, so that we can sit in white robes in crowns of victory with Him in heaven. Guys, if you haven't, haven't, haven't given your life to Jesus, let's do it today. Let's pray. Father, we love You. And Lord Jesus, we thank You. And Father, we just pray, God, as we see this, just this hour of strain and, 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 and pain, God, just coming over the earth, Father, I pray that You would be gracious to us. Father, Your Word says that You will. Father, over and over and over and over again, your word says that you're going to be patient for your elect. And so, Father, we just pray, Lord Jesus, that you would just God, that you would bring about this hour. Father, as the psalmist puts it, God, even so come. God, we're ready. And if we're not ready, God, I pray that at the sound of my voice that there are folks that get ready. Because ready or not, here you come. And so, Father, we just pray that you would just give us a peace in our heart that would help us to know that you can save us from what is coming. Father, we just pray that you would just be gracious to us, be loving to us, Father. Have mercy. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen, guys. Love you.